Good morning, good morning, good morning, everyone. Hello. Welcome back to Diva's Room. <laughs> hello. Let me say hello to everyone that's in the building. Well, honey. Well, honey, well, honey, well, honey. What's up, lady? Jennifer. Good morning. Bev Davis. Hello. Good morning. Darcy, what's up, mama? What's up, mama? Reverend Fat Boy in the building. K Sierra, what's up, Sierra, Sierra? Rocking with the truth. What's up, mama? What's up, lady? Hello. Good morning, flawless beauty, baby girl. Nisi Poo, what's up, mama? Candy, candy cane. What's up, lady? Mom life. What's up, baby? What's up, lady? Hi. What's up, baby? No, no, babe, but you're listening to me in the background. My husband's listening to me in the background. Fantasia, mama, 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 cita, chulita, que pasa, como estas? <laughs> so are you guys ready to get away from R. Kelly for a little bit for today? While his trial is going on, maybe we can distract ourselves with a little Aaliyah. So um, I'm sorry, guys, by the way, I didn't get a chance to go down there yesterday you know, life happens, shit happens, things happen. So, uh, but I got a lot of gist of what went on. And I will do another live of giving you my own opinions of what went on and stuff. Um, I feel like I don't really want to do it in a sense because it's just all repetitive shit. You know, everybody's repeating the same shit. But, you know, Diva puts her own spin on shit. You know how that rock. We rock the boat. We rocked the boat. Well, guys, before we start, um, I found a song that Aaliyah had wrote. And um, I'm not sure what album it was on. Let me see if I can, if maybe they have more information in this uh description box how the hell do you see the description box from here i have no idea i've never done it from here oh okay show more um okay oh let's see if this um uh Okay, this song is called Don't Know What to Tell Ya. And it's by Aaliyah. And it was on the I Care For You album. Um, I don't know what year this was published. I didn't get a chance to, you know, research and look it up. I've been doing all this shit. Uh, <laughs> dealing with R. Kelly and his madness. Um, I'm sorry guys. Um, hello. Good morning to anyone who has just walked into the building. I'm, I'm not looking at the screen, Nikki, but I'm looking at my phone right now and I see the peoples that have walked into the building. Hey, Nikki. so now Aaliyah made this song. Now, the words to the song, uh, the lyrics are going to be on the screen. Let me see if I can. Okay, wait, wait. I got to do it this way first. Wait. Shit. Ah, oh, man. Wait. Share my screen with y'all. Let me take off my uh, overlay. Uh, okay. 
All right. Let's let it set up. All right. Is it going to be full data mode? Okay. And I got to go back. I got to mute. Now, guys, let me know. Give me a thumbs up or one in the chat if you can hear the audio when I play the song, okay? So, guys, did you guys get to peep the words to the song? Hello, Angelica. What's up, Mama? Good morning, everyone who just came into the building. Yada, dada. Diva time. Tasha. Hi, Mommy. Angelica. Ty, good morning, Ty. Hi, baby. Hello, hello, hello. Okay. Okay, now, did you guys peep the words that were on the screen? Papa Smurf is in the building say good morning to papa smurf everybody that's my husband y'all say hello david are you a moderator let me see if you're a moderator david hold on i gotta make you a moderator david david's a moderator now it's a wrap the boss is in the building any of y'all get crazy, he will chop your ass up. Okay. Tune the goon. Danny. What's up, Danny? Say hello, David. The husband's in the building. <laughs> Angelica said, what's up, Papa Smurf? <laughs> Ty already knows David's ass. He's crazy. He loves to be a pain in my ass. So, again, did you guys get a chance to really peep the lyrics on the screen? I'll go back to the video, and we can kind of go over it, all right? All right. All right. First lyric here. Do you see what it says on the screen? It says, you want to handcuff me, but yo, I don't know what to tell you. Right? In this song, I believe she's talking to Art Kelly. I believe that she's talking to Art Kelly. You want to handcuff me, but yo, I don't know what to tell you. Right? Right? Not literally meaning probably to handcuff her, but, you know, keep her close. Keep her there with him at all times, right? Um, second part says, you want my intimacy, but, yo, I don't know what to tell you. In other words, you want to have sex with me, but I'm too young. And I don't know what to tell you. Right? 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 Let's let's dissect this a little bit. Let's just dissect this just a little bit. Um, okay, let me see. Okay. Then this part says, you want a wall around me. I swear, I don't know what to tell you. In other words, he wants to keep her in, no one else to be around her, talk to her, communicate with her. It's all about him and her, right? You want a wall around me. I swear I don't know what to tell you. She's going to become this big star, 
how are you going to keep her trapped? Right? Then we got um, here's the other part. You want my lock and my key, but yo, I don't know what to tell you. In other words, you want my virginity, you're going to take it and you're going to keep it with a lock and a key. Ain't nobody else going to be able to get to it but you, right? So you want my lock and my key, but yo, I don't know what to tell you, bro. I'm like 14. Right? Right? Uh, let's see. What was the other one? The other part says, okay, this is, this is the craziest part of the lyrics. Incarceration, what I'm facing when I'm with you. Whoa. Whoa. That's right. You tell him, Aaliyah. Boy, you trying to keep me in prison. This ain't going to work. I don't need to be uh, incarcerated being with you. I need to be young, free, and living my life, my best life, without you. Ah. That's what she should have said. <laughs> but she said incarceration, what I'm facing when I'm with you. Check that out. Check that out. And she says... Um, wait, 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 I'm trying to get right to it. Then she says, yeah, watching my every move. How many of these young ladies had said that R. Kelly always has someone watching them? A lot of them have, right? He's always got some goons watching them when they're not in his presence. Go follow her. She she's going to be over here, over there. This is the address. You know. That's crazy. Um, okay, let me get to this one. Then here she says, trying to pick up on some clues. So he's watching her, trying to pick up on clues. Then she says, we play 21 questions every time I walk in or out the door. Where are you going? Who are you going to be with? Who, 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 who are you going to be sure? Are, that, are you going to be there? Who's Fulana Fulana? What are you getting? The, what are you doing? Where? With who? Why? When? You yeah, know, those kind of questions. Uh, let's see. Then she said, what do you bother for? Why you bother me when you got like eight other girls in the house? What, what you bothering me for? You got all these other women. You don't need just me. You want all these other women. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> okay. Uh, she get, she said, get comfortable. It's yours. You know, so she's like, you know, it's yours no matter what. Don't, don't act like uh, I'm going to be out here cheating on you. Cause that's not what it is. Like you need to get it together. It's going to take trust to keep our love. Ooh, guys, I want to show you my husband's food. Come in, let me get your camera. Come here, let me get your camera. Let me get your camera. David, come over here, David. And she says, cracking, stressing, and second guessing me time and time again. He, he doesn't trust. He doesn't trust. Oh, my God. Okay, I want to show you guys my husband's food. Uh-oh. Wait. Hold on, hold on.
Do you guys see? I know it looks a little blurry, but it's um, it's a pork shoulder, and it's in the oven cooking right now. That's what we're having for dinner. <laughs> Yada dada! What's up, mamita? In the go! What's up, baby? Where's she at? I just saw her, didn't I? I just saw it. Did I? Oh, I'm bugging. Where is she? Truth strong. What's up, mama? Okay. I'm trying to give everybody their, you know, certain people back their sticks. Okay. Hey, Naomi. How are you, honey? Good morning. Johnny D. Oh, there goes Indigo. Okay. I see her now. Okay. Aisha. What's up, mama? The truth. What's up, lady? Good morning. Okay. 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 All right, guys. Please do not forget to hit that like button on your way in. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Tone the go. Yeah, girl, my husband throws down. He sure do. He knows how to. <laughs> He's even making the rice today. Yes. Yes. <laughs> All right. So let's get back into um, her lyrics. So, you know, she says, um, we go from lovers back to friends. Got to put this to an end. You know, they're constantly back and forth. And then she says the lyrics all over again. So that's that. Now, we're going to now, I got to figure out how do I, okay, I have to, because yesterday I was having a weird time trying to share my screen. Um, right, it's window, right. I have to remember it's window. I have to go to window. Right, this is the window. Right. Okay, share. All right, guys, can you see my window? Let me know if it pops up. Oh, shit, my phone's about to die. Okay, guys. So everybody can hear me loud and clear, right? Are you guys ready for the book? We are here to read. Okay. Okay, I'm loud and clear. I'm going to move my microphone away from my face so I don't sound so loud. I'm not that loud, right, guys? Do I sound like I'm, like, screaming at you guys? <laughs> But like I said, those lyrics are something for you guys to think about there. All right. So, Baby Girl, better known as Aaliyah by Kathy Ian Dali. Now, for Aaliyah, who changed music as we know it, tell my mother I love her. Now, we're going to go through author's notes. I want to know, can you guys see this or is it too small? Uh, 
Can you guys see it? Better now, maybe? Maybe I should go full solo layout. Let me see. All right, let me go back. Hold on. Uh, let me go back. All right, maybe I should do it that way, right, guys? Do it uh, solo layout. All right, let's see now. Uh, view full screen, maybe? No, oh, it's still too small, huh? All right, let's see. Uh, uh, I gotta wait. Here we go. Um, let me see if I can. It's only going to be able to go full screen, and that's as big as I can get it, you guys. Let me see. Yeah, that's as big as I can get it, y'all. But it's all right. I'm going to read, you know what I mean? So. All right. Now, the author's note is what we're going to read right now. And it says that when I first began, working on baby girl, I decided not to write about the circumstances surrounding Aaliyah's involvement with R. Kelly and how it unfolded over time. Considering word had finally gotten out about his predatory and criminal behaviors with minors. Mentioning him within Aaliyah's life story cheapened the narrative. In my opinion, as someone who loved Aaliyah dearly from afar, I felt I was disrespecting her legacy by spreading this part of her life on Front Street when her family never had. I also didn't want to dignify R. Kelly with any credit for her career. Despite him being one of the main reasons we learned about Aaliyah in the first place, his crimes have left most with a pit in their stomachs, anguished at the thought of once supporting him and his music. I will never forget the day I interviewed a then teenage Sierra for her 2004 debut album, Goodies. On the album is a cut called Next to You, featuring R. Kelly, which he also wrote and produced. The lyrics place Sierra in the position of coaxing R. Kelly into letting her stay the night. With R. Kelly being blissfully down for whatever. I noted it, I noted in my feature how R. Kelly's lyrics written for, for a teenager were inappropriate. As two years prior, his child pornography tape had surfaced. It boggled my mind how he could continue writing songs like this for young women and be so well compensated to do so. Members of Sierra's team contacted both my editor and me. They threatened me with slander. In reality, they meant libel. She's not Aaliyah was their pointed second rebuttal. But Sierra could have been. My remarks weren't even against Sierra. She is incredibly talented and one of the torchbearers of Aaliyah's legacy. But the mention of Aaliyah by her team, as if it were a mark of shame, felt so wrong since the blame was gained, was again 
placed upon the teenage girl and not the predator. Again, this was 2004. And while no one really understood what happened between him and Aaliyah back then, I still felt there was an unfair burden to place on someone who was no longer alive to defend herself. Sierra, Sierra never knew this exchange existed, I'm sure. She has always held Aaliyah's name in the highest regard, considering Sierra and many artists who followed were undoubtedly inspired by Aaliyah's work. This wasn't the first time that Sierra would be compared to Aaliyah in some way. And years after that magazine article in 2019, Sierra pulled her R. Kelly collaborations from streaming services. Ah, oh, so Sierra also pulled her song. It wasn't just Lady Gaga and um, uh, Celine Dion and Chance the Rapper. Sierra did too. I call that a tiny victory. I watched Lifetime Surviving R. Kelly parts one and two. Uh, I watched the series with unease. A decade and a half following my article, wondering how his predilection, predilection for young girls had fallen under the radar for so long. His predilection, that's what it was, predilection for young girls had fallen under the radar for so long. I grimaced as young girls were held hostage, their families telling horror stories of their daughters still being in his clutches, while others who managed to escape revealed what they endured with disturbing detail. You could see the torture on many of the girls' faces, and in others you could see blankness and reprogramming. As a viewer, there's an inherent for fear for what their post-traumatic futures will look like once they've inevitably realized they're in an abusive holding pattern. Like everyone else, however, I was too separating, I too was separating Aaliyah from R. Kelly's victims. I was categorizing her the way the media and the music industry had done so often in the past by viewing their relationship as a mutually loving one, not one rooted in grooming and latent sexual violence. Abusive patterns don't discriminate. Prey is prey, and Aaliyah had fallen prey to Art Kelly. He was just as damaging a force in Aaliyah's life as he was to the other very young women he violated. Theirs wasn't a, lo a love story that defied age. It was a tragedy. Oh, excuse me. It was a tragedy that Aaliyah endured and somehow moved past to become an icon in her own right without him. That is the only reason why R. Kelly is discussed in this book. It was only in watching this docuseries and dissecting newfound evidence did I realize that disregarding R. Kelly's chapter in Aaliyah's life would be denying Aaliyah another title she so greatly deserved, Survivor? All right, give me one second, guys. You give me 100 bucks and I give you 100 bucks. I don't have money right now.
It's great. Okay, I'm back, guys. Sorry. I had to take a restroom break and get more water. <clears throat> now... We're going into the introduction part. So the introduction part is goodbye summer. August 25th, 2001. Where were you when you heard that Aaliyah died? Can anybody remember that? Where they were when they found out Aaliyah died? Put it in the chat. Miss Toy, hi, Mama. Where were you, Chanel Lewis? What's up, Chanel? Does anybody remember where they were when they found out, when they heard that Aaliyah died? I found out when she died, I was actually in my friend's house. We were hanging out, smoking blunts, chilling. And one of my peoples that came in and said, oh my God, oh my God, did you hear Leah died? Leah died. She died in a plane crash, guys. It's all over the news. I was like, what? We put on the news, we saw it. Oh God, I broke down and I cried like a baby. I cried, we cried. We cried, shall I say, we cried, we all cried. Me and my friends sat there together, we cried, we hugged each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You were in school, home, it became a crying memorial. You are your grandma's house. Yada said, I thought <laughs> Pissy Piper had something to do with it. <laughs> well, now that we all remembered where we were, she continues to say, Gener generationally, no, generational, 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 sorry, guys. Generational celebrity deaths are such an interesting part of popular culture, aren't they? You remember every detail, where you were, what you were doing, who you were with. You might even hold on to those fragments of memories tighter than you would over the passing of your own distant relatives. That's because those who touch the world on a greater scale for better or worse, have the potential to reach more people and yet affect every single one of them individually and uniquely. JFK, MLK, Kurt Cobain, Tupac Shakur, The Notorious Big, Michael Jackson, Whitney Houston, Prince, Kobe Bryant, the list goes on and on. Through the duration of their lives, no matter how long or short, they may be, these humans became our superheroes. Their morality, however, is our brutal reminder of the former and their deaths become historical events in and of themselves, usually involving some anniversary people grimly commemorate. Since the 
advent of social media that now includes a picture posted with some warm words, a vague memory associated with the dearly departed person and a quote honoring their lives. Certain calendars even regard these deaths as international holidays. Again, showing the correlation between a celebrity's death and their impact on the world. Many, many people have only a rudimentary understanding of world history and key dates. Yet, they can tell you the exact date that their favorite singer died. With the passing of Aaliyah, it was a double whammy of devastation, where there was little time to process her death before a global crisis hit. Just two and a half weeks following Aaliyah Houghton's death on September 11th, 2001, the United States was thrust into a world changing tragedy. The news of the destruction of the Twin Towers overshadowed her passing. With fans left wondering what even happened, considering the details of her plane crash appeared so vague and before we even knew it, two more plane crashes arguably eclipsed hers. Once award show season rolled around, Aaliyah was honored during artist memorial segments and through post accolades. Still, her death left fans bewildered with little time to manage their grief. So even now when you can, when you even now when you scan the comments of her videos on YouTube, the responses almost always include a dismissal. I still can't believe that she's gone. Before I continue, let me answer my own question. Where was I when I heard that Aaliyah died? I was four months out of college and still hanging out at the local diner. It was around 11.30 p.m. when New York City's Hot 97 was reporting the news. I was standing in the diner's parking lot with my friend exchanging our goodbyes after a late dinner. He had an Acura Integra with a custom designed surround system, sound system. So every time he turned on his car, the radio would shake the pavement beneath the vehicle as if it were directed to on command. This time when he turned on his car, the first thing blaring out of the radio speakers and shaking the pavement was famed radio personality and the voice of New York Angie Martinez saying Aaliyah's name on New York's Hot 97. Her wildly bold voice was breaking as she spoke in her thick, immediately recognizable Brooklyn accent. That should have been my first clue, but I continued walking into my car. After all, it was not unusual to hear Aaliyah's name all over the radio airwaves with her songs following in tandem. It was 2001, and Aaliyah had the world in her palm. Her eponymous album had been released a month prior, and Queen of the Damned was being filmed. So Aaliyah was everywhere. Still, Angie's voice aroused my suspicions, especially since this wasn't her usual time slot. So my brisk pace downgraded itself to a tiptoe as my body involuntarily timed its own movements to the stillness of her tone. Hey, I think Aaliyah was killed in a plane crash. My friend called to tell me. I came to full stop. You know that feeling like the sound is sucked out of a room and you suddenly can't hear a thing but the warble of airflow? Well, imagine it being sucked out of the planet because I was standing outside. Ugh. I ran back over to his car listening in disbelief. The news was being reported as information filtered through the pipeline in real time from the Bahamas, where she was killed. The crash happened hours before, though by midnight it was confirmed that she was gone, which explains why most online news articles show a publicized date of August 26, 2001. At the tops of their reported stories, this predates the TMZ 
era where it now literally takes five minutes to confirm and to confirm or deny any piece of information. Back there, back then, there was an unspoken respect for families finding out first. Their window was small, but as the evening came to a close, it was confirmed that so had Aaliyah's life. I drove home crying that night and not like a single uh, glistening tear in memory, but full on weeping as Aaliyah's songs filled my car from various radio stations, blaring her hit after hit. It was like a continuous bout of punches to the gut. Every time another song played, I had experienced the losses of the aforementioned Tupac, Biggie, and Kurt Cobain. But this one felt so different. It was Aaliyah, baby girl. She wasn't supposed to die yet. How could this have happened? There were all of, these were all of the thoughts swirling in my mind as I drove home in a fog. When I walked into my house, my eyes were so swollen that my mother thought I had gotten into an argument with my friend. This may sound dramatic to some, but to others, it makes perfect sense. I felt the stranger's death on a deeply personal level. Aaliyah was born just a month before me, so she was almost exactly my age. I was a newly minted college graduate and my life was just beginning while hers had just ended. I didn't just look up to her, I stood beside her. She felt like my very best friend. The cooler one of the duo where you oftentimes wonder why she chose you to be her partner in crime. That's how close my imaginary friendship with Aaliyah was. Much like so many other people I knew. I mean, she died on my friend Christina's birthday and the next day she cut off all of her hair because she grew it long to be like Aaliyah's signature long tresses. Even covering her one eye with half of her hair like Aaliyah had. For many Halloweens thereafter, friends wore Aaliyah costumes before it became a vintage homage to her on primetime TV series like Ronish or Halloween pics by celebrities like Kim Kardashian and Cash Style posted across Instagram. When I interviewed Quincy Jones in 2007, he asked me if I was Aaliyah's friend since we shared a similar vibe as he punned. He founded Vibe Magazine in 1993. I still haven't completely recovered from the complaint, I mean, from that compliment, and I still wear it like a badge of honor. It became clear to me just how powerful Aaliyah truly was when I covered the two year anniversary of her passing at Ferncliff Cemetery in, Hart in Hartsdale, New York on August 25th, 2003. To say there was a crowd, a crowd gathered would be an understatement. Aaliyah had been put to rest in the cemetery's marbled mausoleum and fans congregated, leaving balloons and flowers, cards, poems, photos with her and her albums at her foot of the wall bearing her name. Her father now rests right above her as he died on November 8, 2012. My best friend Miriam and I stood there in awe at the number of kids around our age, some younger, some older, who stood at that mausoleum wall and publicly mourned Aaliyah. TV camera crews were presented, I mean, were present, documenting the phenomenon. I remember I scribbled in my little reporter book, girls dressed just like Aaliyah are sobbing, boys crying because their crush is gone. <clears throat> Gender motivative, notwithstanding, it was a different time. And now I've seen such an even split between men and women being inspired by Aaliyah and applying her tenants to their own lives. Regardless of their reasons for attending, it was also intense. And when you bring Aaliyah's death up, even two decades later, the reaction is still intense. Whenever I watch her Rock the Boat video, I feel that intensity knowing it was that very music video shot, very music video shoot, 
that ultimately took her life, a life that ended abruptly at the age of 22. Aaliyah was described by music industry people as cool, with a subtle air of mystery. Yet, she lit up any room when she entered. She was known as Lily by her team and those closest to her. The goal was to protect her and shield her from the chaos in which she entered into the business. Her final year of life was an important one where Aaliyah inadvertently made every movement count. I mean, every moment count. She was coming off five years of redevelopment, like her mentor, Missy Elliott's 2002 album title. Aaliyah was under construction. She sacrificed a fraction of her teenage self to the abusive hands of R. Kelly, where she was sketched like a neophyte with raging hormones and a taste for older men on her debut album, 1994's AJ Nothing But a Number. Her recovery time in the media post controversy was impressively swift. Though the healing of her internal trauma seemingly wasn't, she found ways to piece her old self together with her new self on 1996 One in a Million as Timbaland and Missy allowed Aaliyah's airy vocals to be a musicology experiment in their tempering of time-honored R&B music with fragments of electronic music, which in turn elevated the entire genre. Her 1996 Tommy Hilfiger campaign proved she could model, and 2000's Romeo Must Die proved she could act. She even dominated soundtracks thanks to songs like Are You That Somebody and Try Again. So in the last year of her life, she had finally found herself. Her final album was at, aptly to, titled by her Mononomi, Manomi, Aaliyah, <laughs> and she was more hands-on than ever, working with the late producer and songwriter Static Major. Her lyrics were more personal, displaying a maturity into young adulthood while still remaining young, wild, and free. Her starring role in Queen of the Dam was setting the stage for her Matrix Reloaded role, which would later lead to the Matrix Revolutions. Aaliyah was the phoenix who rose from the ashes, yet returned to them just as she reached full form. It felt so unfair. Regardless of what you believe or who you believe in, seeing someone die so young makes you question everything. There was so much more to be done, and now we were left with unfinished business in this story. We watched unfold right before our eyes. Would Aaliyah have married Damon Dash and started a family? How many films could she have starred in? What about all the albums left to record? Would so many of the R&B and hip hop artists who followed her ever have gotten their shot had Aaliyah remained there? There were so many possibilities for what could have become her life, but none of that happened. Aaliyah was just getting warmed up and it felt like she was taken away. Yet through the duration of her physical absence, she's evolved into this mythical creature, a goddess, whose art transformed into this fantastical silhouette that hangs over music. You feel Aaliyah in the songs of today. You see her spirit in the artists who arrived after her. The princess of R&B is an understatement. Aaliyah is at the crown of her music royalty. While she wasn't particularly known as some resounding balladeer, Aaliyah musically possessed a skill set that dubbed her a chameleon. Her voice was a flexible instrument. It could recline on any sound bed and elite, a dreaminess that most couldn't touch and still can't. 
and of course her style, where baggy pants and midriffs were the uniform, is still omnipresent. Now, no comeback needed. The Aaliyah swag is always here in full effect. Designers still replicate the look she, pion she pioneered through working with either them or her fashion choices outside of them. Hearing Aaliyah speak about her passion for music in interviews or watching her move fluidly through her music videos, it's apparent she was otherworldly. Even when she walked this earth, she possessed a different kind of aura where her magnetic personality came through in her music. She was something special, very special. And fans still mourn the loss of their hero and that intangible something she emitted. Those who knew her even expressed to me through conversations that in her presence, they felt like she was nothing short of angelic. In fact, the word angel was used to describe her by so many people throughout my writing of this book. And perhaps that's the most magical part of Aaliyah. She felt abstract and yet tangible at the same time. Her story is one of the last of its kind, where when she walked into a room, she executed stardom and her charisma disarmed anyone who encountered her. While she had family in the music industry, she wasn't an industry plant. She really wanted to be a star. She loved every moment on that stage and loved every fan and every chapter of her, his, of her story, both good and bad. While her impact is palable and her influence is so easy to spot, we have ultimately forgotten that she was a human being who once walked this earth. She was someone's daughter, sister, girlfriend, best friend. Sometimes it's as if Aaliyah were conjured up within our own imaginations, where we can pull from very little to create a real life picture. Unlike other tragic deaths of young stars like Selena, we haven't been given a clear linear story about who Aaliyah was, what she endured, and why she was so special. That is what I have attempted to do with Baby Girl, better known as Aaliyah. Provide those who loved her from afar some semblance of what her real life was like, while providing a small amount of closure in knowing that she made the most out of her 22 years out of her 22 short years. We can always honor her as an angel, but it's time to pay homage to the beautiful black women who kept her inner strength tucked away and preserved through an unforgiving music industry in the name of her love of her craft. Over the course of 20 years, the life of Aaliyah Houghton has transformed from fact to fan fiction we have pieced together this super icon of sorts based upon the parts of what we knew about her during her short time here. Mixed with that, we hope she'd become, had she not died at the age of 22. Since Aaliyah was always wrapped in this air of mystery, it's easy now to idealize every aspect of her. She didn't provide ample information about herself while on earth. So we know about as much in the afterlife as we did back then. It's only now that we are starting to learn more about her, both good and bad. And there's nothing to balance these revelations, especially without her music. Since at the time this book was written, Aaliyah's catalog still sat in streaming platform purgatory. Despite the testing of talks with record labels about finally distributing her music to a whole new audience, 
That lever is waiting to be pulled by her uncle, Barry Hankerson, who has been holding these songs for what feels like an eternity. It was rumored that the music would be released on what would have been her 41st birthday, January 16, 2020. But that day came and went. And by August 25th of 2020, there was the promise that talks had finally begun. By January 16 of 2021, we were still left waiting. So what we're left with now is just a trickle of a new information about Aaliyah's life without music readily available to temper it. Aaliyah changed the world, both on earth and beyond. What you're about to experience is how she did it and how she still does it postimately. Most of, a, most of all, this is a book by an Aaliyah fan. For the Aaliyah fans, both new and old, the ones who cried the day she died and the ones who discovered her after decades passed. The dedicated day ones and the newcomers, along with those who don't even know their fans yet, after all, Aaliyah was more than a woman. She was one in a million. Wow. Yeah, I agree. They should write a tell-all book. That would be good if they spoke about their relationship with Aaliyah. Yeah, genuine too. I'm paying attention to y'all in the chat there. I'm looking in the chat now. You're welcome, guys. Yes, please hit your like button. Hit the like button on the way in, guys. Gracias, gracias, gracias. Very mucho. Thank you. Give me one second. Uh, I just want to see my time, Mark. Okay. So we got another hour of reading, okay? Just wanted to make sure I um, check my timing. <clears throat> okay. Uh, that's 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 the only one I'm giving away. Yeah. And good morning to everyone. Missy, type for me, please. Good morning, Missy. Purple, purple, good morning. Uh, who else came in here? Latrice B, hey. Okay. Miss Toy. Hi, Mama. Okay. All right. All right. All right, I shot at everybody else out, okay. You didn't taste the rice yet? Okay. Puppy, can you light up a bogey? And pass me another water bottle. <clears throat> okay. Okay, good. You got your stick. All right, baby. Just wanted to make sure you got your stick back. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Chapter one. Get your motor running. Detroit turned out to be heaven, but it also turned out to be hell. And that's a saying by Marvin Gaye. Detroit, Michigan was once a city decorated with industrial domination and strong music industry roots. Eventually dubbed the Motor City Detroit would emerge 
as the epic center for the automotive industry. Henry Ford drove the first car down a Detroit street in 1896. Three years later, he formed the Detroit Automobile Company. Thank you, Papa. Thank you. Give me another water, please. Um, uh, what was I? Okay. Almost every automotive company followed, forming their home bases in, in or around Detroit. It was like an industrial mecca. And one by one, it was dismantled. Historians marked the year of 1958 as the beginning of the end for Detroit. Thank you, baby. It was like an industrial mecca. And one by one, it was dismantled. Historians marked the year of 1958 as the beginning of the year for Detroit. Once the Packard Motor Car Company closed shop after 55 years, what was once fueled with promise was now exhausting itself. As the city was losing its industrial stream. However, as the automotive industry had begun its downward spiral, its downward spiral there, music brought new life. In 1959, a Detroit native by the name of Barry Gordy started a musical empire that would change history when, when he borrowed $800 from his folks and formed Tamala Records. Tamla Records. The following year, it was officially incorporated and renamed as Motown Records Corporation. Motown, a portmanteau of Detroit's Motor City roots and the word town was quite frankly the heart of what has now become American popular music, thanks to the black musicians who encompassed it. Barry Gordy physically named the headquarters of Motown Hitsville, USA. The physical address being 2648 West Grand Boulevard. Artists like Diana Ross and the Supremes, The Temptations, Smokey Robinson and the Miracles, The Jackson Five, Marvin Gaye, Gladys Knight and the Pips, and Stevie Wonder were all residents of Motown at one point or another. Detroit would later become the hub of techno music thanks to a DJ named Juan Atkins and the center point for popularized battle rap. Once Eminem became the pale face of Detroit's hip hop scene. Detroit had grit and glamor. It was perhaps the perfect place to grow a complicated superstar who ironically never owned a car. Aaliyah Dana Houghton wasn't actually born in Detroit but in New York, in Brooklyn's, in Brooklyn's Bedford-Stuyvesant neighborhood on January 16, 1979. Her family had roots in the New York Transit Authority, along with operating several small businesses, including a laundromat and a tailor shop. Her father, Michael Miguel Houghton, worked several jobs before later becoming his daughter's personal manager. Her mother, Diane Houghton, was also a singer, traveling early on with a touring theater. I didn't know her mother was a singer. And her father, her father must be Spanish. Michael Miguel? He's Spanish somewhere. Aaliyah got a little Latin history up in her blood. Ain't that something? Never knew that. <laughs> Interesting, right? <laughs> 
Now let's see, where were we? Okay, so the mother was a singer and says, traveling early on with a touring theater, with a touring the theater company, though eventually she became a teacher. She left teaching to be a stay-at-home mom once her kids were born, later co-managing Aaliyah with her father. First came Aaliyah's brother Rashad on August 6, 1977. And then Aaliyah arrived less than two years later. Her name is a spelling variation of Aaliyah, the feminine version of the name uh, Ali, which in Arabic means the high, most exalted one. It can also mean the best and the champion, like Muhammad Ali. When Aliyah was five and Rashad was seven, the Houghton family moved to Detroit, Michigan. There's something very telling about Aliyah being born in Brooklyn and raised in Detroit. For almost the entire duration of her musical career, she would self-identify as street but sweet. It was a cute little rhyme that turncated turncated her style into two words. One's oftentimes diametrically opposed in society. Though paired side by side to describe Aaliyah, they were quite fitting. By the 1900s, by the 1900s, <laughs> excuse me for that, guys. By the 1990s, <laughs> Brooklyn supplanted the Bronx to become the heartbeat of hip hop music alongside Queens. As artists like the, Notor the Notorious Big, Little Kim, Nas, Foxy Brown, Mob Deep, and Jay-Z ran the city. Those Brooklyn roots gave Aaliyah her edge. And she later returned to New York City during this heyday, once she became a star. Meanwhile, Detroit's smooth soul of Motown still gave Aaliyah this indescribable delicacy amid an inner city on the verge of decline. Street but sweet. By the time the Hortons relocated to Detroit in 1984, America, already deep into a recession on President Reagan's watch, was just beginning to rebound. Despite the economy firing back up, work opportunities were still scarce. Diane's brother, Barry Hankerson, had a few businesses in the Midwest, including a food distribution company and some warehouses. So Michael was bringing the family to Detroit so he could work with his brother-in-law. Barry Hankerson was a former football player turned businessman and politician who eventually worked his way into the music industry through the back door of local TV production. He married Motown's own Gladys Knight in 1974 at the height of her career with the Pips. After helping her to produce a TV special, after five years, the two divorced and became entangled in a dramatic custody battle over their son, Shanga Hankerson. At one point when Shanga was just two and a half years old, Barry was accused of attempting to kidnap his son. Oh shit. An article printed in March 10th of 1979, edition of the Indianapolis Recorder stated, sources said the couple has a temporary custody order which allows the child to spend one day with his mother and the following day with the father. It was after the day with the father that Hankerson did not return the child, according to news reports. Hankerson then called Knight and told her he would defy the court ruling and would keep the child. Shanga was finally returned back to his home with his mom. While Gladys Knight was already estranged from her ex-husband by the time Aaliyah was born, she still looked at Aaliyah and Rashad like her niece and nephew. So 
So for those who are always asking, this is me talking now, guys. I'm going to throw my opinion in there on uh, what has been said in these streets. According to the streets, a lot of people were like, why is it that Gladys Knight couldn't manage and take care of Aaliyah? Why did Barry Hankerson put her in the grips of R. Kelly? Well, now you know, after this paragraph that I just read, why? she didn't go work with Gladys Knight because first of all, she was more or less just born, you know, when they were already separated. So Barry Hankerson was already in the music business. Why was he going to turn over to Gladys Knight? He figured he'd use the artist that he's working with. He had no ties with Gladys Knight anymore. Gladys Knight was just an auntie. When Aaliyah was around for, when Aaliyah was around four years old, her mother realized she had the talent growing within her. It started with the young Aaliyah humming back to music, playing in the house. Her tone, even at that age, showed that not only could Aaliyah recognize notes as they were being sung, she could also repeat them herself. Aaliyah then started inching her way into the business. Her family enrolled her in Jesu Catholic Church and School, located on the west side of Detroit. While Jesu was called one of the most influential Catholic parishes in the city of Detroit by former Detroit Free Press writer Patricia Montemurri, who wrote an entire book on the church and school's history. It was also known for its robust theater program. Students of all spanning grades would perform in theater, a would perform in theater company quality musicals, oftentimes held in larger auditoriums like the 375 person theater at Mary Grove College. It was here that Aaliyah got her first break at six years old. She was cast in the school musical of Annie. She had a supporting role as an orphan with one line. As she told the New York Post in July 2001, you're going to get that paddle. Three years later, she started in 42nd Street, only this time through old grainy video footage of Aaliyah at her rehearsals. She's seen dancing and singing front and center as the director Susan McGill Anderson's voice is heard saying it's wonderful because these kids have no inhibitions. The local news interviewed Aaliyah then nine about her role which also included leading the song we're in the money. We're in the money. Aaliyah made a joke about her director yelling a lot though the reporter regarding her as a seasonal little veteran in the local theater circuit. After the show's run, Aaliyah became a local singing fixture from the talent shows and more school productions, such as Hello Dolly and 42nd Street, to small events like weddings and other parties. Aaliyah took part in New Detroit, a racial justice organization that would throw annual events around Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday, where Leah would perform mostly covers of Whitney Houston songs. Ah, she was so talented. Look at that. I didn't even know any of that stuff. She was also enrolled in vocal training with Detroit vocal music teacher, Wendelin Petty, who later taught at the Detroit Academy of Arts and science, who later taught at the Detroit Academy of Arts and Sciences. Aliyah attempted to build upon her acting career when she auditioned in 1989 for the role of a kid sister, Judy Winslow, on ABC's primetime comedy Family Matters about a black middle working class family. 
She didn't land the role, though. Though Aaliyah's first real taste of stardom wasn't far away. CBS's Star Search was one of the earliest examples of what would become the reality competition series of, laters, of later years. Star Search, a pre precursor to America's Got Talent, was where acts of all ages competed against one another. It was similar to an amateur hour um, style show. Though ramped up to make the payoffs far greater than a pat on the back and often minutes of fame, as contestants continued to compete weekly, they would eventually reach a championship show where the grand prize was $100,000. <clears throat> and an air quoted possibility. <clears throat> and an air quoted possibility of a future recording contract putting the star in Star Search. Many legends have lost on that show to opponents whose careers never saw the light of day. A prime example of that is Beyonce's 1993 loss with her group girls, Time, later morphing into Destiny's Child to a five-person band called Skeleton Crew. The wounds of that loss run deeply to this day as Bay used footage of her losing performance for her 2014 single, Flawless. Off her surprise self-titled album in 2013, Justin Timberlake and Christina Aguilera both also lost on Star Search. It was a show that Aaliyah not only was a fan of, but also saw a game-changing opportunity to enter America households, American households with one short performance. My mother and I watched faithfully Aaliyah remarked about Star Search in her interview with Teen People in 1999. And I always wanted to be on it. Aaliyah competed against one of the returning Star Search champions, Katrina Abrams. In round one of the 1990 competition, host Ed McMahon described Aaliyah as a little person with a big voice. Before announcing her to the stage, at 10 years old, Aaliyah didn't look like her future would be spent in loose jeans and tight tank tops. Her grandmother had sewn her a pretty dress, a black form fitted top with the white ruffled bottom and a white half blazer. She had on white tights and black shoes with her makeup and hair done elegantly. She sang the Babes in Arms show tune my Funny Valentine. In a vocal combination of the theatrical version mixed with the Ella Fitzgerald cover, she chose that song because it was one that her mother had sung in the past during her time in theater. And Aaliyah wanted to be just like her. Her performance was dramatic, staged even, where her raw talent is cloaked beneath the obvious preliminary instructions to remain poised and demure while trying to steady her nervously shaking voice. Even when she's interviewed by McMahon, Aaliyah's expressions are very theatrical. Perhaps that was from her previous training or it's the result of child stars misinterpreting fame and maturity and their familiar network co-signing it. Aaliyah lost on Star Search like most superstars do. Katrina received four stars, Aaliyah three and a quarter. She shook her winning opponent's hand and left the stage. Aaliyah broke down in tears once she was off camera. You can mask a child with layers of adult learning decorations, but at the end of the day, they're just a kid. She didn't head home right after her loss. On the contrary, she stayed and watched the show as a spectator and not the winner. Still, Ed McMahon saw something in Aaliyah. 
In Vibe's August 2001 cover story on Aaliyah, circulated during the time of her death, Ed McMahon spoke on remembering her drive in that moment 11 years prior. There's a thing that you see when somebody walks out on the stage, he told writer Han Kim. I call it the fire. They got that inner fire where, which has nothing to do with the schooling, nothing to do with the teacher, nothing to do with the parents. There is a desire that person to please the audience. You see enough of it to recognize it. And that's what I saw with the Leah. While the loss was upsetting, Aaliyah pushed on. She would ask her mother every day if record labels saw her on television and called the family to sign her. It's an endangering inquiry, but really just showed how even a 10 year old, she knew what she wanted and was figuring out ways to get it. Having some famous family members didn't hurt either. Despite Gladys Knight's parting with Hankerson's family, she still stayed close to her niece. She arguably saw herself in the young star. Considering Knight got her big break at seven years old, competing on and winning the original Amateur Hour TV program in 1952. In fact, when Auntie Gladys had her sold out five night residency at Las Vegas Bally's Casino, she had an 11 year old Aaliyah accompany her for each of the five performances. The two would sing a duet of Believe in Yourself. And Aaliyah had a solo moment performing Home, both from The Wiz. The first night, Aaliyah was so nervous that she stood in one spot on the stage, sang, and got right off. Knight pulled her aside afterwards to offer some encouragement. Knight told me, you've got to learn how to move and work an audience. Aaliyah told MTV years later, it was a great learning experience for me. Aaliyah would later credit that string of performances as her greatest training for singing and performing live. From an early age, I knew she had enormous talents and intrinsic 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 gift. Knight spoke of Aaliyah to BBC News following her passing. When she first performed with me in Las Vegas, she was still quite young, but she already had it. That spark the world would later see and fall in love with. Aaliyah was groomed to be a superstar in the most organic way possible. In the late 80s and early 90s, artists didn't have YouTube to film song covers or posts, nor did they have Instagram and TikTok or any social media for that matter. To develop fan followings based upon 15 second clips, Aaliyah was too young for an open mic night, like most rising stars back then who showed up with an acoustic guitar and gumption. Even in those instances, how many really make it into the business? What Aaliyah did have were two dedicated parents who wanted her to achieve her dreams. And they too recognized that intangible something that she had. Even at such a young age, they also noticed an overgrown maturity. I was hot at 10. I had the little sex appeal working back then she told the Late Late Show with Craig Kilborn in 2000. Wow, wow, wow. When I was younger, we were getting me ready to come out in the business. I was looking for agents. So my mother was taking pictures of me and she said, yo, she's got this kind of sex appeal working. It comes through in the pictures and on the camera. That's something her mother said to her. Oh my God. I'm okay. Wait a minute. <laughs> I'm disturbed by this line. I just read guys. What do you mean? She's 10. 
<laughs> She's 10, guys. 11, 12. What do you mean you're looking at her and saying she has sex appeal? This is disturbing. Okay. Oh, Lord. She also had her grandmother, Mintis Hicks Hankerson, who supported her version for her vision for stardom as a kid. If there's anything that inspired me, it's my grandmother. She told Black Beat Magazine in 2001. She always wanted to hear me sing. She would say, come here and sing. Get here for me. It made her so happy to hear me sing. So whenever I am down on myself and feeling down, I think of her. Aaliyah later had a dove tattooed on her lower back in honor of her late grandmother who passed in 1998. She also dedicated her final album, Aaliyah, to her grandmother. Another person who saw that spark in a young lady was her uncle Barry, who by that point was no stranger to the biz. Hankerson was already cutting his teeth in theater, producing Ron Milner's, Milner, Milner's gospel musical, Don't Get God Started from 1987 to 1988, and One Monkey Don't Stop No Show in 1991. He was managing the Winans, also acting as percussionist while co-producing 1985's Let My People Go and 1987's Decisions with Quincy Jones. While Hankerson was in Chicago holding auditions for Don't Get God Started at the New Regal Theater, a young man was attempting to audition. But the auditions were closed per the security guard at the theater door. The young man desperately sang Amazing Grace for the guard. And one of the actors in the musical overheard. It was Chip Fields, known for her part on the 70s sitcoms Good Times and mother to Kim Fields from The Facts of Life and Living Single. Ah, Chip Fields is Kim Fields' mother. I didn't know that. I did not know that, guys. I never knew that. Fields paid the young man $5 to return the next day and sing for Hankerson, along with reading a part of the script. There was one glitch. He didn't know how to read. So the next day when he returned, he played his demo tapes for Hankerson. What Hankerson witnessed was something far greater than a small supporting actor role in an off-Broadway musical. This was a superstar in the making, and Hankerson wanted in on his inevitably success story. Thank you, Papa. The artist was Robert Sylvester Kelly. Wait a minute. He tried to be in what? So there was one glitch. Okay, wait, wait, wait. It was Chip Fields known for her. Hold on a second, guys. Give me, let me pause. Let me get a little ketchup. There is no ketchup. 
ketchup. Yeah, there is ketchup. So, I'm going to read that line again, guys. It was Chip Fields known for her part on the 70s sitcom Good Times and mother to Kim Fields for the facts of life and living single. Now, it says Fields paid the young man five dollars to return the next day and sing for hankerson so while hankerson was in chicago holding auditions for his don't get god started at the new regal theater a young man was attempting to audition that's R. Kelly, guys. But the auditions were closed per the security guard at the theater door. Hi, Mama. Hi. The door, the young man was desperately, the young man desperately sang Amazing Grace for the guard. And one of the actors in the musical overheard. And that actor was Chip Fields. And she gave R. Kelly $5 to come back the next day and sing for Barry. Along with reading a part of the script. But there was one glitch. He didn't know how to read. So the next day he returned and he played the demo tape for Hankerson. And... Hankerson witnessed was something far greater than a small supporting actor role in an off-Broadway musical. This was a superstar in the making and Hankerson wanted in on his inevitable success story. The artist was Robert Sylvester Kelly, a 22 year old Chicago native. So that means R. Kelly met Aaliyah. Let me get Italian dressing, please. I'm getting my lunch now, guys. So now, um, the artist was Robert Sylvester Kelly, a 22-year-old Chicago native who started as a street performer after dropping out of high school, he would sing with his keyboard under Chicago's L Metro Transit as morning commuters. Oh, now you want to kiss me? Yeah, so you walk, yes, so you walked over that way. Uh huh. He, um, the artist was okay. Okay, his keyboard under Chicago's L Metro Transit. Thank you, puppy. So I'm already shook it. Oh, thank you, baby. All right, honey. His keyboard under Chicago's L Metro train as morning commuters would drop donations into his hat. It became his full time job, where in an average workday, he would take home $400. He later formed the group MGM, which stood for Musically Gifted Men. With a few friends, Robert was the front man. The group competed on the Star Search um, show Big Break, hosted by Natalie Cole, and took home the $100,000 grand prize and released the single, Why You Wanna Play Me. Their union was ill-fated since the group couldn't <clears throat> agree on money matters, yet their contract was binding. By the time Robert met Barry, he was attempting to untangle himself from MGM. After hearing him sing, 
Barry slid Robert out of one contract with MGM and into an exclusive management agreement with him. This was in 1990. And that summer, while Robert was at his, fir was at his friend's barbecue, he returned to busker mode and performed for the guests one of whom was an A&R executive at Jive Records named Wayne Williams. Williams approached him after the performance and Robert was later signed to Jive Records as the artist R. Kelly. Barry Hankerson negotiated the deal a year later in 1991. While R. Kelly was working on his debut album, Born Into the 90s with public announcement, Barry brought his 12-year-old niece to the studio to meet him. I sang for him, Aaliyah told Vibe, in 1994, and he liked my sound. Barry Hankerson was hoping to use R. Kelly as leverage to secure a record deal for Aaliyah. Since R. Kelly was not only growing in popularity as a star, but also a hit-making songwriter slash producer for other artists. Labels weren't quite ready for Aaliyah, but Aaliyah was ready to be a star. While Barry's son, Jomo, was in his last year at Pep Perdeen University, he and his father decided to start a record company. Once Barry's attempts to lock and record deal for Aaliyah failed, in 1991, Black Ground Entertainment was formed. And two years later, its flagship artist, started working on her album. Okay. Mwah. Hi, Mama. <laughs> All right. Let's see where we're at. We're going to be on chapter two now. Oh, there we go. Let's see where we're at, guys. Okay. Uh, all right, so I think I'm going to leave it here on chapter two. Uh, this is how I bookmark, right? Yeah. So I'm going to leave it here on chapter two, guys. We're going to leave it here on chapter two. So we will go into chapter two, God willing, a little bit later. I will have time, God willing, if I do, I will come back because I'm about to eat my lunch, guys. Everybody, we're going on lunch break right now. You're welcome, everyone. So, yeah. So now what I'm going to do is, you welcome, guys. I'm going to eat my lunch, lunch break, and um, I'll come back again a little bit later with part two, and I'm also going to try to see what's going on with the R. Kelly trial, and um, bring you guys a little bit of whatever I'm finding out in the moment, but yeah, um, and please, please don't forget, guys, hit that like button, if you have any comments, and you're watching the replay, please make sure you leave your comments below in the video, in the comment. And if you would like to donate to the channel, you can sell me at 347-664-9253. You can also cash at me at Diva Divine Light, as well as PayPal, 
um, dot me forward slash Diva Divine Light. That is my PayPal information. And I will see you guys later.